Praise God. Thank you, mate. Thank you, mate. Hey, a round of applause for our MCs, eh? Yeah. Bit of MC love. I know how it feels. <laughs> They're already killing it. They're already smashing it. Already doing better than me and Caleb did last year. I had a chat to Caleb about it earlier. So, yeah, we've, we've since repented. Um, we're doing good, though. We're doing good. All right. Uh, yeah, feel free to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, while you're turning to there, we're going to have a little bit of a chat about the text. It is, uh, first of all, as um, I can you know, attest as, uh, with all the rest of the speakers, that it is a blessing to be here, awesome to be in our midst, and to talk about a uh, really important subject. So, my assignment, as seen on the screen, is on revival and the local church. Revival and the local church. And as we've all sort of been dishing out uh, definitions of what we mean by revival, and some of them have pertained to the specific topics that we've been talking about, I'll do a similar thing. My working definition that I'll be using and what we're going to be, what, what we're going to be talking about is that revival is when, God, uh, when, when the sovereignty of God pours out in such a specific way that we get to see mass salvation and the conversion of many souls is normatively and primarily done through the ordinary ministries in the local church. So we're talking today about the church's role in revival. The church's role in revival. Or better yet, as we even zoom in on what we mean by that idea, your role in revival. As the body of the church, as those who go to a local church, as those who have come here from various churches around Southeast Queensland and beyond, what is your role in the church? What is the church's role for revival? My aim here today is to be as applicable, as, as doxological, I guess you can say, or as straightforward as I can possibly be, that we can take away from this a duty and a task to fulfill what we can do. I want to be as, a, uh, as applicable to as many people as possible as it pertains to the role of the church and the church's function, and again, by extension, your function in revival. And when I say your function, and when I say you, I mean you. I don't necessarily mean pastors. I don't necessarily mean missionaries or YouTubers or podcast extraordinaires or maybe a lot of what we might think are individuals who exclusively have a role to play in revival. I think that is a misconception. What I mean are those of which that are saved by the exact same spirit of God as those individuals and have a part to play in the local church. Those who now love God are in the body of the church of whose head is Christ and those who have been saved by one and the same spirit, by one and the same gospel and saved to a higher calling to serve King Jesus as he sits on the throne. And so, I don't want today to be merely a reminder of all of the great things and all of the great ways that God has worked in history or merely be a reminder of all of the great things that individuals have done in the past. I don't want us to just reflect and think of how cool those people are and maybe just hope that one day someone like them will rise up and souls will start getting saved around here. It takes the earnest of us, off of us. However, and we'll get to Ephesians 3, <laughs> however, when we hold consistently, as we'll read, that the church is the manifold wisdom of God being declared everywhere, universally, and to this world, it then applies that all who are saved by one in the same spirit and one in the same gospel have a part to play. This is what we mean by the church, the local gathering of the saints, the assembly of the saints. What we don't mean, and this is worth mentioning, when we're doing a topic about the church, what we don't mean is Bible study at Macca's on a Tuesday. What we don't mean is home church. We don't mean listening to Paul Washer sermons on Sunday and calling that church. We don't mean that. The local assembly, the local gathering and mustering of the saints is what we mean. 
The ordinary means by which God has blessed his people in providing for them a place to worship in which he will dwell, a pastor to preach from the pulpit, the saints coming together and singing the truths of the gospel that has saved them in unity, prayer being delivered to the Lord, sacraments being administered truly for our spiritual nourishment, and all the necessary logistics to make that all possible. What I'm saying is that there is an intentional, spirit-led, God-ordained power in the hands of the church, and to quote Jesus, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And if you think that's boring, perhaps maybe it's a side mission to your ultimate plan in life and your goals, if you think that's boring, if you think that's a side mission to your goals in life, even if, even if showing up to church on a Sunday is already a grudging task for you, then you are fundamentally at odds with all of the people you think are cool from church history that have fueled revivals. You're at odds with them. You're at odds with Paul, which we'll read in Ephesians chapter 3, and you're at odds with the head of the church who is Jesus Christ himself who has saved you. So with that in mind, let's read Ephesians chapter 3. I I trust that you've opened to that. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 through to 11. It says this, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you don't think the church is the thing, the plan A, the ordained means that God continually pours out his spirit for revival, you are at odds with Paul. The church is the thing. The church is God's plan for revival. Paul goes, after after explaining what God has done for him and saving his soul and calling him to be a minister of the gospel and a church planter, planting churches throughout the Mediterranean, that was his life, that was what he was called to do. After explaining his call for mission, he communicates his view of the church. He wants to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He wants to proclaim the gospel and see souls saved. He wants to bring light to the mystery that was hidden before ages, that Christ has now been revealed, and he pours out his spirit upon the church and has saved them and is its head. Also that through this church, church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known universally. It was God's plan A. Let's look at two fundamental errors that we can make. Firstly, the church was not God's plan B. Wasn't his plan B. Right, sometimes we can seek to downplay the church and downplay the function of the church and downplay the way we think about God's church in that it was just a, a sort of band-aid fix for all of the ways he had failed previously. Like it's some, some kind of necessary evil. It's some kind of add-on to everything else that seemed to fail in the Old Testament. I guess I'll just build a church. That'll be my plan B. You know, my dwelling place in Eden got destroyed because silly Adam broke my covenant. I guess that dwelling place is gone. And so what I'll do is I'll make altars in and through Noah, all the way through to Isaac and Jacob. Oh, well, that's not good enough. I'll make a tabernacle through Moses. That'll be the new plan. Oh, you know, that's not good enough. I'll get Solomon to build a temple and that'll be cool. That is where I'll dwell. And then for whatever reason, we might think that the church is just one of these many ways that God has decided to dwell among his people. And it isn't really all that special. It isn't really all that different to all of his previous establishments. And so it's really just his plan B. 
Solomon's temple gets destroyed by Babylon. But then, but then, in the first century, we get the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. We get the pouring out of the Spirit at Pentecost, and the church age kicks off in full swing. Pentecost has arrived. Acts 2, believers are already gathering in the households, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They're, the, they're, they're devoting themselves to the breaking of bread, and the church is being called... From Paul, the manifold wisdom of God being showcased and the mystery being revealed that was hidden for all ages. And the rest of the New Testament confesses all that that was true, all that was true in the past, all that was true about the dwelling places of God in the temple and in the past was but a mere taste of what would to be revealed in the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you. And if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Who's Paul talking to? He's talking to the church in Corinth, as disgusting as they may seem, as, 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 sin, uh, as, uh, as many sinners that they are, the disgusting outward patterns of adultery that we've talked about even from this stage also. And yet, they are the temple of the living God. Verse 9, we are fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Paul, much like what I'll get into, uses this very language as leverage to get them to act rightly before the Lord and keep on portraying the wisdom of God throughout the world. This is his leverage. You are the building of God, start looking like it, is his call. And we'll do a a little bit of that a bit later on as well. The church needs to start looking more like the wisdom of God being revealed to this world because the church is the plan A. It is the thing. It leaves all those Old Testament types and shadows in the dust of its ultimate glory in portraying King Jesus, who was the glorious mystery revealed in every single proclamation of the gospel that is given from the stage. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 16-18. For we are the temple of the living God, as God says. And then what Paul starts to do is he starts to quote all these Old Testament texts back from uh, uh, Leviticus, Exodus, even Jeremiah 31 that was promising a new and better covenant where God will dwell with his people. He applies all of that to the church and he quotes God and says, I will make my dwelling among them and I will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 18, I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God. Almighty. As Tom, Tom uh, he posted on Facebook the other day. Any, anyone from Hope Logan here? Yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, from memory, I think it's pretty much a membership requirement that you follow him on Facebook because it's just like the, the pin, pinnacle of academic. Uh, it, it goes Bible, LBC, and then Tom's Facebook. And, <laughs> and I'm quoting it. So I don't even go to the church. So he said something like that he would take one local church service in the New Covenant era, over 40 days at Mount Sinai. All the flames, all the angels, the massive booming voice of God coming down from heaven, and yet the local gathering is more glorious. Let's even think a little bit more. Let's let's, let's do more of a bird's eye view. We think of Solomon's temple in all of its glory. You have like the most expensive stone-paved building with all of, the, all of the laced gold all around. You have the high priest walking out with his fine, expensive linen with shoulder pieces of gold with, with, uh, with uh, precious jewels embedded into the gold. And it looks glorious and it looks amazing. And yet, the mature, new covenant believer should safely, without a shadow of a doubt, confess that the most basic cold brick building, community center, whatever it might be, right? Sometimes you get kicked out because other people pay more money. That's what we're <laughs> suffering from this, this, this weekend, right? The most basic of community centers, right? The most basic of, of, of individuals on stage, right? You get your Reformed Baptist pastor and his jeans and his flannel, right? It, is, it may not be as outwardly glorious. And yet, God blesses the church. And yet, 
It is a far more glorious occasion on the Lord's Day because what we get to do is we get to look back and what Jesus has done for us in being that glorious mystery revealed to this planet that he has redeemed sinners by dying on the cross for their sins. And we get to sing about that in unity. And we get to pray to our Lord because of the mediator. And we get all of these blessings. All the beauty in the old covenant, all the the beautiful temple and all that outward show is nothing in comparison to gathering on a Sunday to commemorate the risen Lord who has saved people by his blood. The church. The wisdom of God being revealed to this world. The church is not a plan B. Second misconception. Okay, it's not a plan B. But it's also not a failed plan A waiting for a plan B to fix it. Right? Which is to say that all current and future establishments, even as they focus to or or pertain to revival, all come short of God's ultimate glory in the church, which again is his plan A. Your side hustle ministry doesn't replace or come close to revival fruit or growth in the kingdom as compared to the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Evangelism is great. All these things are great. Missionary, missions are great. Seminaries are great. YouTube channels, awesome, great. Podcasts are great, sometimes. But there's only one institution placed here by the Son of the living God, and that is the church. Pastor Craig at Haddon, when we were doing the, the, uh, our, our church lecture, Pastor Craig, uh, Dr. Craig, I'm sorry. Forgive me my transgression. I think I I just lost 10% on my mark. Dr. Craig, uh, uh, he brought this statistic uh, uh, in talking about the importance of the local church and in talking about the the, the salvations that we can see uh, as we we sort of survey the landscape of of salvations that occur under, uh, under heaven. And not only does the theology of what I'm talking about speak for itself, but those statistics come in full force and confess that the majority of salvations that occur, occur in the context of the local church, in the gathering of the saints on the Lord's day. Well, it is God's perfect, ordained, eternal purpose that he has manifested in the Lord Jesus Christ. How could it not be, right? How could it not be the case? The theology almost informs the statistic, and the statistic backs up the theology, even if the statistic doesn't really line up with logic. I mean, you think about the maths behind that statistic. It seems fairly unbelievable and impossible that it is the case that that is a reality. You can spend six days, which is more than one day, right? The Lord's Day is on Sunday. It's one day. You can spend six days... And let's sort of break that down into waking hours, depending on how long you're awake for, about 16 hours a day, 22 hours a day if you're a mum or a dad, right? And, and you can spend all of that time doing your thing, evangelizing, talking to people in the workplace about God, handing out tracts, public mission, whatever it might be. And yet, on that one day at church, on the Lord's Day, is the time when people are majority saved. Let's narrow it down. It's not, the, it's not even the 16 to 22 hours on the Lord's Day because we don't have church services that go for that long, I think, right? Maybe two to three hours, and yet more people are getting saved at that time than the rest of the week. The plan A is a good plan. The plan A won't fail. It's not waiting for a second fulfillment plan B to fix it. It is God's plan A. Evangelism is great. Missions are great. Hours and hours in the workplace having gospel conversations with your friends are great. Seminaries are great. YouTube channels are great. But are you inviting people to church? There is only one institution placed here by the Son of the living God, and that's the church, and souls are saved in it more than anywhere else. And so when you come up with something better than a foundation laid by Jesus, and you won't, because like I said, it says in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 3, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The church is God's plan for 
revival. And the foundation is laid by Jesus Christ. And the question is, what is a sort of fuller and more complete understanding of what we mean by that sentence? What is really the church built on? We can say Jesus Christ, but what do we mean by that when we say that? Well, I think Peter, he, he sort of halfly, rightly uh, confesses this before Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, right? You get that famous uh, plea that goes out. Jesus says, who do you think I am? Peter answers rightly, and he confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then you have all of the Old Testament typology and the shadows, uh, you know, swirling around. Everyone's thinking Psalm 100 110, sit at my right hand until I put enemies under your feet. Isaiah 9, unto us his child is born. Oh, that's that guy. That's awesome. Psalm 2, kiss the son lest he be angry. And it's upon this confession to which Christ builds his church. Unless, of course, you're a Catholic. Unless, of course, it's Peter and he's the proto-pope. However, I don't need to argue that. I don't think. That's silliness. However, there's more. There's more. There's more to this passage which fundamentally describes more of the nature of this rock to which he builds his church on, and there is more to what this Son of the living God, Christ, must do. And this is where Peter went wrong. This is when Jesus yells at him. This is when Jesus calls him out and says, get behind me, Satan, because he missed this part of the whole Old Testament typology and shadows, particularly as it pertains to, Matthew, uh, as it pertains to Isaiah chapter 53. He missed that. And it's that this, in, Ma in, in Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples, it's the same chapter, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. That's a part of it. That's a part of God uh, uh, blessing his church. This is more of his foundations being laid and we cannot miss that. The church is God's plan for revival, and it's built on the foundation of the blood of Christ, which he has redeemed sinners from the condemnation that they deserve. Christ suffered in the place of sinners by dying a bloody death on the cross in their place that he would establish the very foundation of the plan A. For the means that God brings his kingdom down, your kingdom come, your will be done. And it was the will of the Father to crush him and have this whole ordeal take place. It was the will of the Father to do this in eternity past in the covenant of redemption. I'll appoint you as savior of this people of whom I've chosen for eternal life. You'll go, you'll die a sacrifice in their place and accomplish redemption for them. And I'll send my spirit to apply all of this beautiful truth in real time. And then this Christ, who was commissioned to this task, undeniably succeeded. Amen? He's now seated at the right hand of the Father and is now, Ephesians 5, head of this church. Head of this church. So you know what that makes you? That makes you the body of the thing. That makes you the body of the plan A. You are the body of the church whose head is Christ. And so what does this mean for you? Are there any Calvinists in the room? I don't know if there's just not many or you're being true Calvinists by not opening your mouths. But... Some of us might not be. That's okay. We can, we can you know, shorten it for anyone who may be visiting or may not know what I mean. It basically means God is really sovereign and you really suck. God is really sovereign. And so when we're thinking about the sovereignty of God, like we did yesterday, it's been really brought up throughout today. Mr. Uh, Dr. Damon was talking about the sovereignty and providence of God in these miraculous times of revival. That is awesome. And God is truly sovereign. However, us Reformed folk can sometimes fall into the very uh, uh, disguised trap of thinking, well, if God's sovereign, then I guess we're sweet. Well, if God's sovereign then I don't have to really do all that much, right? And this, this sort of hyper-Calvinistic approach that just says, well, I'll leave the doors open and maybe God will bring people or he won't. But he's sovereign, right? So it's not really, there's not really any earnest on me to try all that hard or to do anything. Maybe it's not that outward or maybe it's not that uh, 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 obvious in that kind of language. Maybe it's just that I'll do the very bare minimum at church and hopefully God will raise up a Spurgeon one day. 
And that's what I want to focus on in my talk today. I remember when I said at the start, I want it to be very straightforward, I want to be very applicable and doxological in my argument, so strap in, here it comes. If God is sovereign, He also ordains the means. Anyone who understands the sovereignty of God should, un- should understand that reality also. He also ordains the means. And so what if, and let's be very audacious, and let's, let's uh, speculate a little bit, and we should be praying for this, but let's be, let's be a bit audacious. What if the hands that came together to put this conference together was a means ordained by God? What if, by some stretch, maybe, what if the local churches who have gathered to put the hard work and labor into all that we're doing right now, what if it was planned by God that someone would be playing the keyboard right there and that someone would devote their time and energy into placing this pulpit right here, whoever you are, and to set up the chairs, right, so that we could all be here, so that the speakers could put together their lectures and to renew the minds of the hearers. What if all of this could be a means by God to stir people up for revival, and maybe we could see one in our lifetime? All because the sovereign God works through the ordinary beings in the context of local churches to funnel and set flame for revival. You are the body. This is coined as the ordinary means of grace that God can use to perform the extraordinary work of revival. It might seem like the most physical, maybe useless, maybe unspiritual act of just setting up the chairs or just being here, present, right? It might seem so physical and unspiritual to do it. And yet, the God who is sovereign can use it to save souls. I mean, we think about something as basic as handing out a tract. It's pretty much the most physical thing you can do. You don't even have to talk to the person. You hand out this weird card plastic thing to them. They might read it. They might not. They might chuck it in the bin. It's a physical act. And yet, the sinner could read that tract and God could supernaturally revive that dead sinner unto new life because he has received the data of the gospel and trusts in it for salvation. Or God can use the preaching. Or God can use the gathering. Or or God can use the meeting with the Lord on the Lord's day. God can use all of it. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. This is appealing to all of the different gifts that we can have in the body of a church. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verses 4 to 6. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith. We see an example of this in Nehemiah chapter 8. You you can almost, uh, we get this sort of picture of this sort of proto-church service. You can read it in your own own time for more context, but it's essentially this. You have Ezra opening up the Torah, standing on a wooden plank, that they just put together. He's before hundreds, if not thousands of people. He's blessing the Lord while he's reading. He's hearing amens and hallelujahs from the crowds. The people are lifting up their hands. They're bowing down and worshiping Yahweh. It's starting to sound a lot like the Great Awakening. It's a type of revival. They're mourning and weeping in repentance over their sin. And Ezra is literally having to tell them to quiet down because he has to keep reading the law. And he called that day, Holy to the Lord their God. And all similar themes are present in this age. The Bible, the sermon, getting up to preach, the worship, the reading of the word, the fellowship that we have with one another, the sacraments, all the elements are there. All the preachers in Ephesus using these elements to do the exact same thing. And as has been spoken about today, it literally turns the town upside down. We have the same thing. The church service, the gathering of the saints, the whole lot of it. And so the question to ask is, what is your view of the church? Do you still think it's a plan B? Do you still think it's not the thing or it's not exciting? 
or your life is more important, your business is more important, your money is more important, your holidays are more important. William G. Taylor, as uh, we've referred to both today and yesterday, speaking of a, uh, uh, his revival breaking loose in Toowoomba, he says this. He says, the work began where all genuine revivals should begin, within the church itself. He says, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the infant church and then followed the gathering in under one sermon of 3,000 converts. It has ever been thus. Would that at this writing I could reach every ear of every minister and every church member in Australia and elsewhere. It would be with an earnest cry for the church itself to awake and put on its strength. And then he comments, in Toowoomba, the work began silently. He says that it began silently, slowly, amongst our own people. No special missioner was invited. No unusual efforts were put forth to awaken public interest. The work grew from within. A fire was gradually kindled that went on in burning connection with the ordinary ministries of the church. Now, I have no idea how I'm doing for time, but I have five points or five questions, really, of application as we can either sit here and ponder or we can pray about later or we think about them for the rest of the weekend and when you're at church, there are five questions that you can ponder in your mind. This is all considering what we've talked about. This is, this is presupposing that the church is the manifold wisdom of God, that it is the thing, that it is the plan A. It is what God uses for revival. Right? What did the apostle do with his ministry? He was a church planter. He cared about the church. Jesus cares for the church, and that's why he died for it and is itself its head. He nourishes and cherishes It's church. Those are the presuppositions we're working with, and here's some questions. Some of these might seem very elementary. Question one. Do you prioritize the attending of the local church on a Sunday? Considering all we've talked about, right? Do you find excuses as to pretend that there is a better place to be? All right, let me put it this way. I spoke about this last week at church. I'll put it this way. The church is literally and theologically the best place for a human being to be on a Sunday, let alone a Christian. Question number two. Are you so invested in the gathering of the church that you do just that? Invest in it. Time, energy, resource, money, Or do you prefer your hobbies? Do you prefer your holidays and your habits? And let these things take all the resources from your life, leaving you disinterested in the church. Question three. Do you make an intentional effort to invite everyone you know to church that they receive the word of God and be saved? We covered most salvations occur at church. It is the best place, again, for a human to be. Are you inviting more humans to church? Revival is the pouring of supernatural power to save the masses, and your invitations might just be the means to fuel that. Question four. Are you praying for your church that it would be fruitful in adding souls to the kingdom to instigate revival? And part of that includes praying that you can safely answer those first three questions and that many more can. These prayers will be multifaceted. Praying for God's calling in your own personal life. Praying for more pastors. Praying for more missionaries. Praying for more servants. Praying that the kids in the church will be raised in the Lord. Praying for more churches to be planted. Praying for more souls to be added. Are you praying for the church. And question number five is simply this. Do you even believe wholeheartedly in your heart, do you believe that Jesus deserves more souls worshiping him? Do you believe that? Edwards uh, used 
uh, something very similar as his very first positive mark of revival, and it's this. He says that it is seen in the elevation of people's esteem for Jesus. Do you think he deserves more worship? If you answer all these questions with faithful honesty in and of yourselves, you will be on track with your church to spark revival in Australia. And imagine just this. Imagine everyone in this room is influenced by these very questions and can walk away from, them, uh, fr- fr- from this room uh, 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 faithfully answering them. Imagine what that would cause in Australia. Imagine what could happen. Let's hope for it, let's pray for it, let's work together with God's means for it, and let's be a church that honors our King Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, may we, <clears throat> Lord, may we desire that you be more and more glorified. May we, may we desire that more and more souls be added to your kingdom. May we desire that your church would grow and that your kingdom would come just like Jesus prays. Lord, we desire that King Jesus receives all the more worship in glory because of all of the ordinary means that you have provided for us to make that possible. Lord, we thank you for the gift that you have saved us, but would we be uh, uh, filled with zeal to go on to preach your gospel to many more, that many more may be added to the church, that many more may glorify your son, and that your kingdom would grow all to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.